Can scientists first sequence the human genome, so like the complete genetic blueprint for making a person? They're like, dude, where are the genes? So the, they found like there was like 3 billion nucleotides, so like DNA letters, and they only ended up finding like 20,000 protein coding genes, so genes that had the instructions for making a protein, so like recipes kind of. But it turns out that the genes are actually like split up, like the protein making parts are like split up over long distances. So with the genes, so this is just like a shoelace and I have this tape on it. And this tape is supposed to like represent like exons. So these are the parts of the actual protein making instructions. And they're separated by all these long stretches of like called introns that are actually gonna get removed. And so sometimes this stuff is thought of as like junk DNA kind of, they did like it's what they originally thought or whatever, but now they're finding there could be like all sorts of cool stuff going on in here. Like you could have like binding sites for things and like all sorts of regulatory stuff. But what happens is that, so in your gene you have like double strands, there's two of these, and then one of the strands is used to make pre-mRNA. Um, so mRNA stands for messenger RNA, and it's like the recipe copy that ribosomes the protein making complex are actually going to use to make the protein so what happens is that so one strand gets made into this mrna and it has all of those like intron regions and so if the ribosome were to go and like try and make a protein out of this it would be all gibberish because it's got all these like long regulatory regions so these actually have to get removed in this process called splicing so these get like removed joined together the exons get joined together to f and then the introns get removed and you get your final gene, which I can't like hold up right now, but it would be just the colored parts. But another cool thing, a cool thing about having these introns so in addition to all like the regulatory stuff that can go on in them, you can also have like them, you can join the exons in different ways, which is called alternative splicing. So like you could splice out like multiple of these so you can do like that, and so now I have blue, yellow, whatever, and then these two get removed. Or maybe I want to do it like just these. Or maybe I want to start at the green and not at the blue. So with alternative splicing, you can do these sorts of things. Um, and so there are different ways to do this. And so sometimes if you have ones that can be like just like removed, like so you have it in or not, those are sometimes referred to as like cassette exons. Um, you can also have ones where like you have to use one or the other, like alternative choices type of thing. Um, so that's one of the cool things about having these introns is that you can make, so we might only have like 20,000 separate protein coding genes, but we can make like oodles and oodles of proteins. It's crazy. So yeah, so scientists originally like there were all these bets about like how many genes the human genome would have and they were thinking like millions or something, whatever. A lot of people are gonna probably lost a lot of money. In fact, like the most genes we, is like this like parasite that has like 60,000 or whatever. But that doesn't, but that's cause our genomes are just like so smart and cool. Um, we can connect in different ways. Another cool thing about having this like intron exon system is you can get something called exon shuffling. So like an exon from one gene. So say like part of this gene got duplicated or something. And now, like, because you have that, like, backup copy, you already have a good copy, right? So now evolution can play around with that second copy and, like, join it with other things and that sort of thing. And so you can get these whole new products. And so you can actually end up with different proteins that have, like, parts that came from the same place. Um, so I think it's really cool. Um, so, yeah. So I'm going to, like, try to explain things, how I like to think of things. It's kind of, like... A recipe um, and so we're gonna be like if you have a recipe for like a three layer cake you don't want to have to have like if you want to make like a two layer cake or one layer cake you don't want to have to have the recipe for all of those if they have the same thing right so you would just have a single recipe and then you would just use parts of that recipe and so to make different products and so that's kind of like what's going on here and you still have that original recipe which is the instructions for making all of them so you're saving a lot of space in your like cookbook and your recipe shelf or whatever um so that's um how we're going to look at things and i'm also going to talk about how splicing can go wrong so a lot of diseases actually are caused by problems um, with splicing so a lot the splice sites so like the exon intron junctions 
Um, they have like sequences usually that get recognized by the spliceosome. So like this RNA protein complex that recognizes those sites and then does that loopy out and remove type thing of the portions you don't want with the introns. Um, but sometimes if the site is like, there's a mutation at like that site or whatever in that sequence and it doesn't get recognized. And that could lead to like introns being left in or um, which can, then you have like gibberish in your protein. Um, or it can lead to um, like the wrong sp exons being spliced and stuff. Um, and so there's actually, I talked in my like cystic fibrosis post about how like a lot of the mutations involve splicing. And so sometimes what happens is that you have like non-functional protein made because it's the splicing is wrong. But what you can actually do is like um, there's drugs called like antisense oligonucleotides that can actually like bind to regions and help them like get recognized or not get recognized as splice sites and that sort of thing. Um, and so like I also in like um, spinal muscular atrophy, there's like a drug that so there's two copies of the SMN um, gene. And like, so one of them is like the normal version that makes this protein that's really important for like nerve and muscle cells. Um, but in people with this SMA, they have this problem in their, in the main version of that gene. And so they, it's missing like a big part of the protein and it doesn't function. But so people have this like other gene, like SMA2, which is this like, it's pretty, it's almost the same, but it has like this splicing problem where it makes this non-functional protein. And so they have these ASOs that actually fix that um, splicing pro problem and help it get like recognized and spliced correctly. So it makes the full length protein. And so that's like this drug called Spinraza, which is, um, was helped developed by like Adrian Craner, who um, is a doctor here professor here um who i actually rotated in his lab and so i studied splicing in my first rotation and now i'm here where i study kind of sl slicing and so i always like mess up and say splicing and then my pi has to correct me but anyway so that's just um one aspect of splicing that we'll get into and then i also want to talk about um the idea of cdna or complementary dna so it's because it comes into play when you're doing things in the lab especially recombinant protein expression. So with recombinant protein expression, you're taking the genetic recipe for a protein, sticking it into like a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid often, um, that has like, and then stick, which serves as like a vector or vehicle for getting it into cells that can express the protein for you. So like bacterial cells or insect cells or that sort of thing. Um, but so you don't want to stick in like this whole long pre-mRNA pre thing. Because, well, for one, like, the bacteria aren't going to be able to splice this thing for you. And even if they could, they wouldn't know which splice version you wanted, right? So, what you want to do is you want to, you want that to take a version of the final mRNA you want. So, you choose, like, which splice version do you want? So, there's usually, like, a canonical splice version. And then, um, so I'll show you in, like, Uniprot, you can see there's, like, a canonical version. And then there's often, like spice isoforms um and so sometimes you want to look at a specific isoform but often you just want the like canonical one or whatever um and so what it is what you do with the cdna is that you take that version of the protein so i'm just going to pretend like the these two oh i think i switched this around whatever okay so but pretend like this is our final protein so we cut off all this stuff um, what we would want to do with the cDNA is take a, make a version of this and put it into the cells. But this is the, um, like the mRNA, so it's RNA, we need to make a DNA. So we make DNA of it, and then we stick that into the cells. Um, and then the cells can make it for you. Okay, so now let's look in more detail in graphics and like cakes and stuff. So going back to that bakery analogy. So our cells are what we call eukaryotic. So basically eukaryotic things are almost everything except for bacteria and like archaea and stuff. We won't go into that. But it, we have, it means we have these like membrane bound compartments in our cells. And like one of our main compartments is the nucleus. And so it's this membrane bound compartment that holds all of our DNA. And so our DNA has, is our, like our full set of DNA is our genome. And so it's split up into these long, um, these like, pieces are kind of like volumes of like 
cookbook volumes called chromosomes and these are actually the so those like xy looking things those are actually like long 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 coiled up um, pieces of DNA and so it has tons and tons of genes and also tons and tons of regulatory information so in addition to the like the introns we were talking about that are between the exons there's also like a bunch of like long regions in between genes and that sort of thing so there's tons of things for regulation and there's also like just like parasitic elements so basically just like DNA from like ancient ancient viruses or whatever and it's not harmful or anything and so sometimes our cells actually co-opted and stuff but anyway it's just to say that you have a ton of ton of DNA and then some of it is genes and then some of those genes are exons and then some of it is introns so if you think about the um, the chromosomes as like volumes of your cookbooks um, and so and now your genes would be your recipes right so we're going to talk about genes in the terms of protein coding genes, so genes that actually have instructions for making proteins. Um, but there's also genes for like functional RNAs, like microRNAs, which I study or whatever. So a functional RNA is just like an RNA that functions as an RNA and not as it's not just like an intermediary to a protein. But so you have these cookbooks in your nucleus, um, and the protein making complexes. Um, they're called ribosomes, and so these are these big protein RNA complexes that actually are going to go along that messenger RNA, um, read the instructions, and make the corresponding protein. But the so those are in the cytoplasm, so that's just like the general exterior part of the cell, so it's like outside of the nucleus. So it's inside the cell, but outside of the nucleus. Um, and the DNA is stuck in the nucleus. And um, so we need to get a copy of the recipe out to the ribosomes, to our chefs out in the cytoplasm. Um, and so there's a couple advantages to doing things this way. One is that you keep that DNA safe. So you keep your original cookbook safe. So it's like the reference section of the library. Um, they're not going to let you like check out their like ancient maps or giant reference books is that everybody needs to use and that sort of thing. Um, so you want to keep that DNA safe because that's like your permanent recipes like you don't that's what's going to get passed on to the next cells um, so when that cell divides to make more of itself um, and so you want to keep it safe um, and also you only have like two copies so you have one copy in each like copy of your chromosome because you get like one from mom one from dad that sort of thing but you'll need you probably want to make more than two copies of the protein at a time um, so this allows making the mRNA, you can make lots of copies, you can make lots of mRNAs out of it. So that's another advantage of mRNAs. Um, and now we get to the, what we, this post is supposed to be about, which is the, um, the splicing. So you, ha you can make different things from that original recipe. So we'll think about like, for now we'll just have like a cake, okay? So we have this three layer cake, here it has frosting, but we'll just pretend that frosting's a layer because in the other figures it's going to be a layer. So we have this three-layer cake. It has like this chocolate layer, the strawberry layer, and this vanilla layer. Um, and so we want to, if we want to make the three-layer cake, we'd want to splice those together and do it that way. Um, so the splicing is actually going to happen in the nucleus. So what's going to happen before it actually exits and goes to the cytoplasm? So one of the actual steps like that the nucleus um, makes is like make sure that it gets sliced, spliced before it gets exported out. Um, so part of this involves the addition of these like exon junction um, complexes. Like so once the splicing occurs, it leaves behind like evidence or whatever. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. But so in the nucleus, so you originally make a copy of one strand. So the genes are double stranded DNA and we want to make what a single stranded RNA. Thankfully to us, for us, DNA and RNA are like really similar. Um, and so they're both these like long strings of nucleotide letters. Um, so the RNA has like a slightly different sugar. So it's like ribonucleo, uh, ribo, um, ribose instead of deoxyribose. So D DNA doesn't have this OH here. And they have these like bases, which are these letters that stick out. And so 
these form these specific base pairs, so G to C, A to T, and A to U. So RNA has U instead of T, but it can still pair with A, so all's cool. And you can use DNA to make a copy of RNA or RNA to make a copy of DNA, as long as you have the right copying machinery. Um, and so we have the right copying machinery, so we have um, a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase that can make an RNA copy of the DNA. And so it's just gonna do that with one of the strands. Um, and because the DNA is like anti-parallel, so the strands are going different directions, it's important that it goes like the right direction. Um, and this comes into play if you're like designing primers or whatever, so it's just something to think about. But anyway, um, when you have, so it makes that mRNA, that pre-mRNA, so it still has like the intron regions, and then it has to get spliced out. It also has a couple other things added. It has like this cap added, this like five prime, methyl, it's like a backwards methyl group type thing, or backwards G with this methyl group. Um, and then it has this like poly A tail, so a bunch of adenosines in a row, so that's just one of the RNA letters. Um, and so this is gonna help um, like protect those ends from degradation. Um, and so that like the cell doesn't freak out and think it's some foreign RNA. And it's also going to serve as kind of like binding points for a bunch of different proteins and other factors that are needed to help um, process it and uh, make protein from it and that sort of thing. And so yeah, so then it gets exported into the cytoplasm where the ribosomes go through um, and make the protein and that process is called translation. So transcription is where you make that mRNA copy. Um, then you have like splicing, capping, tailing, that sort of thing to get the mRNA from the pre-mRNA. Um, and then translation is where you're gonna make the protein. So now let's get into the fun stuff, um, the splicing. Okay, so going back to the idea of exons and introns. So normally you'll see um, something like this, um, usually less colorful, but you'll have like a thinner strand is going to be um, like representing like introns and then you'll have like shaded in like boxes that are gonna represent the exons. Um, and so if you go back to the cookbook, it would be like, so you have a, your exons, so the exons are the parts that are going to get expressed. They're going to, they have the instructions for making the protein. Um, well, they can, can get expressed. Remember, you might not use all of them, um, but the introns are, you can think of like interrupting the actual like recipe. So you can think of it kind of like regulatory notes that only upper management needs. So only the stuff in the nucleus needs to know that information. And it's not useful once it's out in the cytoplasm. Um, so those introns are gonna get removed. Um, and then it still has these like regions at the end that aren't exons. Like there's like this five prime untranslated region and this three prime untranslated region. So those parts aren't gonna get used to make proteins. They don't have protein making instructions, but they have important like regulatory information that, and like binding sites and stuff that the, um, that stuff in the cytoplasm needs. Um, but it's on the outside and it's not like interrupting the exons in the middle. Um, so you can get alternative splicing when the, um, sorry, that's the, okay. you can get alternative splicing um, in different ways, like you can use different sites. Um, so this is just showing in this sort of like exon, a cassette exon model where you like either include or don't include something. But you can also have like alternative splice sites like within an exon. So instead of starting at the beginning of this exon, it might like start in the middle uh, and then make uh, like a slightly smaller middle layer and that sort of thing. So there's all sorts of things that you could do with ex alternative splicing. Um, so in cells and stuff, this is often used, um, sometimes used to make different versions of the same protein in different like cell in types, different tissues and that sort of thing. So sometimes you might also help, it might have like a short version and a long version of a protein and like maybe one version is membrane bound and one version is soluble. Um, maybe one version has a binding site for some protein and the other version doesn't. Maybe one version has like a nuclear localization sequence. So it gets like traffic to the nucleus and the other just stays out in the cytoplasm. So there's all sorts of different um, reasons why alternative splicing is really useful. Um, and then the other kind of fun thing is exon shuffling. Um, so this is where like different um, 
so this is actually so the splicing remember it's happening at the RNA level so you can have tons and tons of pre mRNAs and you can splice them all different ways and you still have that DNA like that's still normal like you can still have that full length DNA um, you haven't touched it at all so it's good for your cells to like play around and like make um, different versions and different cells and all that stuff um, but that those changes are only affecting the RNA so those aren't going to get passed down what can get passed down is like the information in those regulatory regions that helps determine how they get um, spliced um, but the spliced versions aren't themselves going to like get passed down um, but what can get passed down is if you have exon shuffling so that's going to occur in the actual DNA version um, so it's long lasting and it can get passed on and that sort of thing and that's it's a um, cool way for evolution um, to like if an ex like so an individual exon can get duplicated or exons from multiple genes can get combined um, and so you can get a whole bunch of different products um, and not all of which are functional speaking of what not always being functional um, so as I was mentioning before like splicing mutations um, can cause like a bunch of diseases and so you can have things like exon skipping um, where a like exon is actually like removed or intron inclusion where you have an intron um like this, like an intron is left in or you could have um like partial exon skipping where so before i was talking about how you can have alternative like splice sites so sometimes that's good and that's useful but sometimes it's bad and it can um, cause problems and so another thing so like sometimes if you have exon skipping or if you have or if you have like a partial exon skipping or you have an intron inclusion it can lead to what's called a frame shift mutation um so the um genetic code so it's like how it works is that like three mrna letters like stand for whatever like spell like one protein letter so when the ribosome is going along it reads in like three letter chunks um, non-overlapping chunks or whatever and so if it goes from the if you get a frame shift mutation what can happen is that those chunks shift so instead of like saying make peace you're saying oink plan or which wouldn't be good um, and it can also lead to a premature stop codon um, so, uh, which could trigger something called nonsense mediated decay. So, one of the three letter words, or a few of the three letter words, so UAG, UAA, or UGA, spells stop. Um, and so, if you have like a splice um, site shift or whatever, or if you have just like a single point mutation, so like a single letter change that turns a letter into a um, stop codon, then the ribosome is going along and it's going to stop too soon. Um, so sometimes you could get you could get like defective proteins and that sort of thing. It can also trigger something called nonsense mediated decay. So when I was mentioning before, like those exon junction complexes. So when the spliceosome like spl does its splicing, it leaves behind like evidence in the form of these exon junction complexes. Um, and so when the ribosome's going along, it's gonna like plow through those. Like the first time the ribosome's translating a mRNA or into a protein, it's gonna go along. And if there's like, it's gonna plow through those and like push them off. If there's one left over, like before, like if it stops before one of these things, it can cause problems because these exon junction complexes actually serve have like they have like surveillance stuff, so they're actually like checking to make sure all is okay. Um, and so if the ribosome, um, if there's one of these that doesn't get like removed. Um, and this ribosome stops before it, it can actually, like, they can interact and then it can lead to the ribosome, um, like, the protein getting tagged for, like, um, the proteasome and where it goes and gets shredded up and stuff. Um, so I'll have more on that in another post and I'm not, like, a huge expert on it, so I won't try to, um, as much. But, um, so there are drugs that can help correct splicing defects. Um, so some of it has to do with like 
So there's things called, I talked before about how there's like sequences that often like signal that something's a splicing site. So there's also like splicing factors, like so proteins that can actually bind and help the splicing machinery like recognize or stay away from a specific site. Um, and so the ASOs often work, so anti-sense nucleotides because they're like the opposite of the sense strand. So the sense strand, the sense strand of like a DNA or whatever is like the version that's going to, that has like the protein instructions. And so remember DNA is double stranded or whatever. Um, and, and so if you have a version of like the complementary strand to the one that's used, um, then it can actually bind to the um, pre-mRNA. Um, and if it binds in a way that like makes the splice site the splicing factors bind or not, or, or sorry, not bind, um, then it can influence splicing. Um, and so these are basically just like made sequence specifically for the various mutations. Um, and so they can like hide ones that introduce splicing silencing sequences um, to prevent binding to splicing or presser proteins. Um, some of them also have like things attached to help do these sort of things. Um, so I talk more about this in my posts on like cystic fibrosis. Um, there's also, I've talked about, um, so SMA, so Spinraza. Um, so before I was talking about cakes, here I'm talking about robots. Um, but yeah, so SMN1, this is like the normal SMN1 protein. And so, um, and then there's this backup SMN2 but it's usually sliced, spliced, see? Now I'm saying sliced instead of spliced. But there's usually like um, spliced in this way that removes this like exon, it skips this exon. Um, so yeah, so this delta, this is delta signal means like indicates that it's missing. Um, and so this protein isn't like functional, but sometimes it gets spliced like this, including exon seven. Um, and then these ASO drugs actually, what they do is they make it more likely. Um, so basically without this drug, there's this like splicing um, silencer site, intronic splicing silencer. So it's in an intron. There's a sequence that gets bound by this splicing repressor protein, which prevents the like splicing. So it gets removed. But the um, Spinraza, it, it's also, um, that's the, yeah, Nusinersen. Um, it binds to that site, um, which then um, prevents the splicing repressor from binding, um, so then it can get included. Um, and yeah, so it's just like a strand, a little strand of like slightly modified to be more stable, um, and clay acid. Um, and yeah, so splicing can be, um, really cool, but it can also have problems. And then the one other thing I wanted to say was when you are doing protein, um, recombinant protein production. So you're going to take, um, you want to use cDNA. So cDNA, you want to like, so you choose like the splice version that you want, and then you take a DNA copy of that and put it into your vector. So you often see like things say like cDNA libraries and that sort of thing. Um, so the mRNA strand, so the cDNA strand is like the complementary strand to it, but then actually what you're putting in DNA is like two, like this, so you have like a, D a DNA version of both strands um, because DNA likes to be double-stranded and then you put that into a plasmid and make it. Um, but you don't want to stick in that original gene version because it's going to have all those introns and stuff. Um, and how you might feel tell things have like so before I was talking, the other day I was telling you about Uniprot. Um, so this is just like um, an entry for alpha tropomyosin, which um, is a muscle protein that's like binds actin and helps with the contraction. Um, and there's different splice variants. And so how I know this, well, how you can know this is if you go to like sequences, this entry describes 10 isoforms produced by alternative splicing. Um, no additional isoforms seem to exist. So sometimes when scientists, they can like detect different isoforms if they just like sequence like the RNAs. Um, but not all of those are functional. Some of them are like mistakes. Some of them um, 
might be f functional and stuff. So some of them, there's like not that evidence for them actually having a function, um, but they are thought to be present. Um, but you can see some isoforms really are like known or whatever. Um, so this says like, this one's known as skeletal muscle. Um, and this isoform has been chosen as the canonical sequence. So all positional information refers to it. Um, and so this is like the skeletal muscle. T um, this one is smooth, but made of smooth muscle, fibroblast, um, that sort of thing. Um, and so you see these will be like different versions. So this one's like shorter and that sort of thing. Or that one's actually the same line. I don't know what's the difference. It probably says a different combination. But anyway, um, and so you can also like if I go to ensemble, um, if I go to like splice variants, you can see that like I can see, you can see the different combinations. So some of these have like retained introns. Um, some of these start in different places. Some of them you see like say nonsense mediated decay. So that's going to lead to um, that like process I was telling you about before. Um, that some of these do make functional proteins and that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, so here's where you have like the exons are going to be these dark lines and then the introns are going to be this. So you can see like the size, there's so much intron compared to like the little exons. Okay, but anyway, um, that's enough for today and hope that helped.